Hi, I'm Michael Weber, Artistic Director of Chicago's Porchlight Music Theater. Opening October 13th, 1903, at the Majestic Theater at Columbus Circle, Babes in Toyland, with music by Victor Herbert and a book and lyrics by Glenn McDonough, marks the oldest production we have yet presented on this program. Following a three-month tryout beginning June 17, 1903, at the Grand Opera House in Chicago, followed by a tour to several East Coast cities, Babes in Toyland followed in the theater where another successful extravaganza for families had played, The Wizard of Oz. Producer Fred R. Hamlin and director Julian Mitchell, who hoped to create more family musicals, both came from The Wizard of Oz production, and book writer Glenn McDonough had helped Mitchell with revisions to the Oz libretto by L. Frank Baum. Mitchell and McDonough persuaded Victor Herbert, who would become one of the most successful composers on Broadway with The Red Mill, Naughty Marietta, Sweethearts, and the Ziegfeld Follies, to join the Babes in Toyland production team. The show featured some of Herbert's most famous songs, among them Go to Sleep, Slumber Deep, I Can't Do the Sum, and especially Toyland and The March of the Toys, both of which have become holiday perennials. Weaving together various characters from Mother Goose nursery rhymes into a Christmas-themed musical, large audiences were drawn to the production by the spectacular and opulent sets, such as the Floral Palace of the Moth Queen and the Garden of Contrary Mary found in Toyland. In September 1904, two national tours went on the road, the first class one playing a three-week New York return engagement beginning on January 2, 1905, again at the Majestic, and then continuing its tour, kept the scenic effects and much of the original cast making stops in major cities for extended periods of time. The second-class tour, with a reduced cast and orchestra, was streamlined for short stays on the road. The piece was so popular that it spawned other fairy tale shows over the next decade. Hear from the December 24, 1949 episode of The Chicago Theater of the Air, our Mary Frances Desmond as Jane, Jonathan Holt as Alan, John Barclay as Uncle Barnaby, and Butler Manville as the toy maker with special guest Colonel Robert McCormick of the Chicago Tribune in Babes in Toyland. <laughs> Produced and narrated by Marion Clare, conducted by Robert Trendler, written and directed by Jack LaPrandre, Mutual presents radio's greatest hour of music and drama, the famous Chicago Theater of the Air. Tonight's special Christmas performance, the great childhood operetta by Victor Herbert, Babes in Toyland, starring Marie Haddon, Lois Fair, and David Polary, with an all-Chicago dramatic cast headed by Mary Frances Desmond and Jonathan Hole. Ladies and gentlemen, as a prelude to this musical Ode to Christmas... It is our pleasure to present a special Yuletide message by Colonel Robert R. McCormick, noted historian, outspoken American patriot, and distinguished editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune. Setting the scene for Colonel McCormick's message, here is The Night Before Christmas, featuring Elmira Ressler, John Barclay, and the orchestra. The Night Before Christmas. was the night before Christmas, when all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care, in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds, while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. 
And the mind had cut you. And you and your cat had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, we sprang from our beds to see what was the matter. Away to the window we flew like a flash, tore open the shutters, threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new fallen snow gave the luster of midday to objects below. When what to our wondering eyes should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer? as dry leaves of before the wild hurricane fly when they meet with an obstacle mount to the sky, so up to the housetop the coursers they flew with a sleigh full of toys and St. Nicholas too. And then in a twinkling we heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. And we threw in our heads and were turning around. Down the chimney St. Nicholas came with a bow. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry. His cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow. And the beard of his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth. And the smoke, it encircled his head like a wreath. He had a round face and a little round belly. The shook when he laughed, like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump. Oh, my jolly old elf. And I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave us to know we had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work and filled the stockings, then turned with a jerk and laying his fingers aside a nose and giving a nod up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew like the down of a thistle. But we heard him exclaim, ere he drove out of sight, Merry Christmas to all, and to all a good night. Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel Robert R. McCormick. Tomorrow will be Christmas, which, according to the Oxford Dictionary, is the day on which we celebrate the birth of Christ. There's no knowledge in existence on what day the birth took place. December 25th was not adopted until some hundreds of years afterwards. It is likely that the founders of the church chose the solstice, the shortest day in the year, both because from it would spring the new calendar, Anno Domini, and because pagan people looked upon this as a traditionally religious day, would the more readily accept the new God. With the confusion of the calendar, the solstice could easily have become December 25th by the time that day was accepted, as it had become other days in the Orthodox and Armenian churches. In the same way, the original Easter day could have been the equinox, also held in reverence by primitive people. The changing moons have brought our Easter's upon many different Sundays. Christmas and Easter are our holiest days. It have both come other practices quite alien, 
but not objectionable to Christianity. Into Christmas has come the Druid solstice. The Druids with their holly and their mistletoe of religious significance to them, forbidden as pagan by the Puritans, now only decorations. In old England, every boy who plucked a holly berry could kiss a girl. Over here where holly is scarce, under the mistletoe has been substituted. Bringing in the Yule log was a ceremony, and it was a principle that it is not fit at meat to sit until the Yule log has been lit. It became customary to take a great log, soak it in water to make it burn the slower. As long as the Yule log existed, the wassail continued. In some instances, a remnant of the old log was preserved to light the new one. I do not think in the early days that wassail had the connotation of extreme drunkenness, which it has since received. Wine goes back to the ancients. In the country too far north for grapes, there was mead made from honey for the nobles, brewed drinks and cider below the salt. Later came distilled liquor. The afternoon was celebrated in exchanging calls and drinking eggnog. With the Yule log came the boar's head, a feast before the finer meats were known. Later came the domestic meats, mutton and beef, with which mustard must be served. Peacock for the nobles, brought in by the noblest and most beautiful lady present. Goose for the lowly. With us, the turkey had become the Christmas bird. Mince pie and plum pudding came with the Middle Ages. The pie soaked with the pudding burning in brandy. The giving of presents goes back to St. Nicholas of Myra, Asia, patron of mariners, merchants, robbers, virgins, and children. His tradition greatly changed, came to America from Holland as Santa Claus, which it appears it reached via the Northland. Certainly his sleigh and reindeer came from Scandinavia. You remember the quadrain? To the night before Christmas and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hope that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The Christmas tree also came to America from Germany or Scandinavia, where evergreen trees existed. And there the fiction was that presents grew on the trees. In England it was first erected in the royal palace at about 1840 by the Dutch Prince Albert for his wife Queen Victoria and their children. Feasting on holy days is a custom as old as history, perhaps created to make them popular. Holidays from school served the same end. The Puritans made all holidays solemn and severe. The English never resumed the old Christmas after the Puritans. Their celebration and giving of gifts comes from the following day called Boxing Day. Presents are given in boxes to children, old servants, and the postman. However, in this class-conscious country, the householders dance with the servants on Christmas and officers wait on the enlisted men. Our Christmas is taken from the continental countries, Scandinavian, German, and in the south from the French. In that latitude, another pagan costume has been adopted, the shooting of firecrackers invented by the Buddhist Chinese. Christmas week we sing carols such as, God rest you, merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay, for Jesus Christ, our Savior, was born upon this day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. While shepherds watched their flocks by night, all seated on the ground, the angel of the Lord came down, and glory shone around. Enjoyable is, as is a genial, even jolly Christmas dinner. Pleasant as it is to sing and listen to carols, a joy to observe the delight of little children in Santa Claus and the Christmas trees, 
The real celebration of Christmas transcends all of these and must be held in your church. The birth of Christ was the greatest event in the history of the world. Vicious as the world is today and filled with criminals in high places, it is far superior to the eras of paganism. With many backslidings, the course of Christian nations has proceeded forward. Slavery, the commonplace of paganism, has passed away. Tortures, formerly an essential of criminal justice, have been abolished, largely from our familiarity with the cross and the crucifixion. The celebration tomorrow will touch the consciences of all. May it shame us into abolishing the curse of international viciousness, for Christmas is the day of the Savior of mankind. Speaking from the stage of the Chicago Theater of the Air on the eve of Christmas, 1949, Colonel Robert R. McCormick, editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune, has delivered a significant Yuletide message, free copies of which may be obtained by writing to the Mutual Broadcasting System, Chicago 11, Illinois. Now the curtain rises on tonight's Chicago Theater of the Air special Christmas production of Babes in Toyland by Victor Herbert, starring Marie Haddon, Lois Fair, and David Polary with narration by Marion Clare. Babes in Toyland. That is. <laughs> of course you do. Anyone knows that it's Little Boy Blue blowing his horn. And look who else is coming along right now. That's right. Tom Tom the Piper's son. That's exactly who it is. 
And look at this silly looking fellow. Hey, uh, has anyone seen the pie man? I want to taste his wares. Well, I'll tell you, simple Simon. If you'll go down that way toward the fair, I'm sure you'll find a pie man along the way. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I want my supper. Where is my supper? Oh, yes, he's here, of course. Little Tommy Tucker singing for his supper. Look out, Jack! Look out! <laughs> Wouldn't you know it? Jack and Jill just tumbled down the hill. No, I won't. No, I won't. No, I won't. No, I won't. And there goes our old friend, Contrary Mary. And little Bo Peep was busy watching her sheep. Why, Grandmother, what big eyes you have. <laughs> the better to see you with, my dear. And little Red Riding Hood and that awful wolf. They're all here, children, and a lot more of our favorite friends. So don't go away. Listen closely to the story of Babes in Toyland. There was a rich and mean old miser named Barnaby. <laughs> this cruel old man hated children and loved money. Especially he hated his nephew, Alan, and his niece, Jane. For Barnaby was Alan and Jane's guardian, and he knew that the young people owned a fortune of their own, which would be all his if Alan and Jane were to die. How can I dispose of them? How can I get rid of those brats and have their fortunes for my very own? Somehow they must perish, perish, perish. I'll find a way. Oh, Alan, hear the sleigh bells. Isn't Christmas time wonderful? Well, yes, it's wonderful, all right, but Jane... I've been worried. Worried? Uh-huh. About what, Alan? No one is supposed to worry at this time of the year. I know, but I can't help it. I don't like the way Uncle Barnaby looks at us. I don't think he likes us. Oh, why, Alan, you must be mistaken. Uncle is cross sometimes, but surely he likes his own nephew and niece. Jane, I think he'd like to get his hands on our money. Well, people do say he's an awful miser, but... I think we ought to take our money and go away somewhere. We could sail for Spain. Oh, or... Alan. Alan, do you think we have enough money for that? We'll ask Uncle. We'll make him count our money for us and tell us just how much there is. And we'll help him at it. Oh, no. Don't ask me to add anything, Alan. You know how terrible I am at arithmetic. Oh, gosh, I'm not so good either, Jane. We'll have to ask some of our friends to help us. If a steamship weighed 10,000 tons and sailed 5,000 miles With cargo large of overshoes and carving knives and files If the mates were almost six feet tall and the balls near the same Would you subtract or multiply to find the captain's name? about their money, indeed. If they want to go to Spain, I'll see that they sail. But I'll see that they fall overboard and drown, too. Then their money will be mine. If a pound of fruit <laughs> costs 13 cents at half past one today, and the grocer is so bored 
Would he wears a dollar five to pay? And if with every pound of tea he'll give to cut that play, how soon would Willie break his face on his new roller skate? I know what we'll do, Jane. We'll ask Contrary Mary to talk to Uncle Forrest. She's very good at figures. Oh, yes. Contrary Mary is terribly smart. I'm sure she'd help us. Well, isn't this good luck? Here comes Contrary Mary now. Yes, and all of her friends. Come on, Alan. We'll go and talk to her. Mary, Mary, why contrary? How does your garden grow? We told us several thousand times. Again, we'd like to know. Again, we'd like to know. Mary, Mary, why contrary? Was in your morning walk. Or maybe in your garden we all day. We love to hear you talk. 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 Hello. Mary. Contrary Mary. We want to talk to you. Hello, Alan. Hello, Jane. Mary, we want to talk to you about Uncle Barnaby. We... No. What? I don't want to talk to you about anything. Well, why not, Contrary Mary? We want you to help us. I won't, because I'm contrary. Won't you do anything that people ask you to? Of course not. Mary, hmm? when I get a little older, I was going to ask you to marry me. What would you say if I did? I'd say no if you said yes. If you said no, I'd say yes. Mary, I don't understand you. I don't understand you at all. Well, even if you married me, you wouldn't understand me. No one understands why people get married. Huh? Why must you be so contrary? Because that's the way I am in the nursery rhyme. You wouldn't want to foil that, would you? Well, no. But maybe if you marry me someday, you won't be so contrary. Before they were married, they talked like this. Well, lovey, so lovey, gift of a tear. Will only so known as be ever true. And so little oozily oozy is ooh. Ha, 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 ha. Pardon the laughter that was before, but this is after. Ha, 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 ha. Pardon the laughter that was before, but this is after. No wise man will disparage marriage, and yet it is so very strange that, that when you marry, marry unless you marry, you both will find a dreadful change. That when you marry, unless you marry, you both will find. to me. If we want to take a trip to Spain, we must talk to Uncle Barnaby about our money. Uh, money? Did I hear someone mention money? Oh, oh. <laughs> hello, hello, Uncle, Uncle Barnaby. Barnaby. What did I hear about a trip to Spain? Well, well, well you see, Uncle, we, 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 well, that is, we, we... Yes, Uncle. Oh, we thought we might, I mean, if you could afford your... They pay... want some of their money so they can take a trip to Spain. Indeed. Well, well, that's interesting. But it's our money, Uncle. Why, of course, of course. 
Of course you shall go to Spain if you want to. Oh, Uncle, may we? Do you really mean we might go? To be sure, to be sure. How can I deny my dear nephew and niece anything their hearts desire? Bobo. Uh, yes, Master? Come into my den, Bobo. I want to speak with you. Uh, yes, Master. Bobo, I have a very important duty for you. Yes, Master? My niece and nephew, Jane and Alan, think they are sailing for Spain tonight. Yes, Master? But they are not. Hmm. They will be waiting on the pier for the ship tonight, and they'll expect me to send them their money. <laughs> I will pretend to send you with the money, but while they are standing close to the edge of the pier, you will push them off in the water below. Oh, it's you, you, you. They will drown, and I will be rich. <sighs> I'll pay you well. You understand what you're to do? Uh, yes, master. <laughs> Isn't it thrilling? Our ship will be in soon and we'll be off to a world of our own. I hope Uncle Barnaby sends our money pretty soon. We can't sail without that, you know. Hello, Ellen. Hello, Jane. Oh, uh, hello, Bobo. Hello, Bobo. Where's Uncle Barnaby? He sent me instead. Oh, you mean you brought us our money? No. Master told me to push <laughs> your button. <laughs> Jane, Jane, where are you? Right here, Helen. Uh, uh, Help me. Help me. Well, I, I, I'll hold you up as long as I can, but if, if we don't get help, we'll both drown. Did you say you needed help? Oh, Helen, uh -huh. Helen, look. Could Mary, Mary, come out in the rowboat? Oh, Mary, Mary, you saved our lives. It's my nature. I'm just contrary enough to spoil your uncle's plans, that's all. Well... Are you going to climb in, or do you want to stay out here and drown? Oh, Mary. Mary, we don't know how to thank you. Well, now what are you going to do? Oh, Alan, I never thought of that. We can't go back home now. Oh, gosh, that's right. Now that we know that Uncle's trying to do away with us, it wouldn't be safe. Oh, what can we do, Alan? Where can we go? There's only one thing I can think of. Well, what is it, Mary? What can we do? Well, I'm afraid I'll have to take you to Toyland. Toyland? Toyland? Do you know where it is? Well, of course I know where it is. It's way beyond the deep, dark forest. You're not afraid, are you? No. No, of course not. Are you, Jane? No, I... Well, come along, then. I'll show you the way. We have a long journey ahead of us. When you grow up, my dears, and are as old as I, you'll often ponder on the years that roll so swiftly by, my dears, that roll so swiftly by. Oh, my 
This is Porchlight Development Associate Mandy Katz. Thank you for listening to WPMT. If you value programming like this, please consider making a donation today at porchlightmusictheater.org. We appreciate your consideration and hope you enjoy the show. are in a terrible predicament. Their miserly guardian, the mean Uncle Barnaby, has attempted to drown them so he can have all of their money. They were saved by Contrary Mary and have started off for Toyland to escape their dreadful uncle. But what of Uncle Barnaby? What are his plans now? Bobo? Yes, Master Barnaby? I've been foiled. I've learned that Jane and Alan were saved from the water by Contrary Mary. Yes, Master? Pack our bags. You and I are going in search of Toyland. And when we find it, we'll see that they do not come back alive. Oh, yes, Master. <laughs> Alan? Yes, Jane? It must be terribly late. And the woods are so dark... I'm awfully sleepy. Oh, oh, I'm sleepy too. But I I keep hearing voices. Someone laughing and still there's no one here. Do you suppose they're fairies? They might be. Oh, oh I can't stay awake another second. Oh, oh. I can't either. We'd better try to sleep, Jane. We'll continue our journey in the morning. Oh. All right. Oh. There is nothing dear. You must live this day. I am watching here. That cannot be. Sleep at overtime. Tis a cypress tree. Peep. 
I have been careless and lost my sheep. Say, have you seen them, Jack and Jill, during your journey up the hill? They're, They're not, not on the, the hill top, top, but in the, the wood. They, they may have met with red riding hood. Don't cry, for me, don't cry. To find your sheep, we'll try. We'll seek them far, we'll seek them wide, we'll seek them low and high. Don't cry, for me, don't cry. To find your sheep, we'll try. We'll seek them far, we'll seek them wide. Tom Tucker may know, Simon or Peter, or Bobby Shafto. Never mind, Bobby, we'll find your ship, no matter where they be. So be gay, Bobby, for stay your ship, so at home again you'll see. that with them? Well, well. Sure, and there's lots of company in the forest this morning. Oh, Barney, I'm very grateful to you for finding them. Sure, and the pleasure's all mine, Bo Peep. But, uh, aren't you going to introduce me to your friends? Oh, oh, excuse me, Jane and Alan. This is Barney O'Flynn. Well, uh, top of the morning to you. How do you do, Barney? It's nice to meet you, Barney. Uh, looking for Toyland, were you? Yes, we've come a long way, but still we haven't found it. Well, sure, and I'm just the man to lead you to it. Say, Barney, I remember seeing you somewhere. I don't doubt it. I'm one of the main helpers in Toyland, and quite a lad with the ladies, I don't mind saying. Oh, of course, I've heard about you. Me heart he have stolen, he the thief of me soul. Me sin says he have taken Trying Helen and Venus excelling, they never rush like you. that you should sing a song about me. I think you and I will be great friends, lad. Thanks, Barney. And if you could take us to Toyland, we'd be very much obliged to you. Oh, oh, it's just around the bend. No sooner said than done. Come on, Bo Peep. Bring your sheep along and we'll lead the way. 
Oh, look, Alan. Huh? This must be fairyland. Toys everywhere. There's Tom Tom, the Piper's son. And Simple Simon. And Little Red Riding Hood, too. And Tommy Tucker. Everyone's on parade. <laughs> Sure, and I have a real surprise oh, for you. Oh, where are you taking it? Right through this door, please. Ooh, this is an odd place. Smells like wood and enamel and glue. That's just what it should smell like. This is the toy maker's workshop. Is it really? Is this where all the toys are made? Well, well, what's going on here? Uh-oh. Hello, Mr. Toy Maker. Barney O'Flynn, what do you mean by bringing people here uninvited? Well, sure, and I didn't think you'd mind if we just looked around. Well, I do mind, by golly. I'm running some secret experiments, and I don't want to be disturbed. Go on now. Skedaddle. All of you. Oh, we're sorry, Mr. Toymaker. We're very sorry. Well, I guess we didn't make a very big impression on him. Oh, him, sure, and he's been acting very queer lately. Faith on his secret experiments must be mighty important. Well, I'm terribly curious. You wait here. I'm going to sneak back and see what he's up to. Uh Uh-uh, now wait, lad. I'd advise against it. And so would I. Don't you dare go in there. Jane, you're being just as contrary as Mary. Well, you have no business going somewhere that you're not invited. Here, here, you two. Don't quarrel now. I'm glad you're my sister instead of my sweetheart. That's all I have to say. And so am I. I'd like to have you for a bow. Is that so? Yes. Well, I... You're 
But just as contrary, as contrary, Mary, you girls are all the same. Through beauty entrancing and silly romancing, you hope a boy to tame. Oh, it's so hard to know what to do, for who knows the big hole from true? But one thing I do know, the same thing that you know, I cannot be fooled by you. Sure, and he didn't mean it, Jane. Did you, lad? Did you? Say, now, where did the lad go? Oh, Barney, he must have gone in the toy maker's shop after all. Something terrible might happen to him. Oh, there he is, bending over some flasks or something. It's awful to be so curious, but I just have to find out what his secret is. Let me see now. All my life I've waited for this secret, and now I almost have it. If I just spread my magic chemical on these toys, it will put souls in them. Actual souls. They will become real, live people. My toys will become people. Now for the test. Here is the moment I've dreamed of. Ah, they're moving. My toys are alive! Alive! What's this? They're attacking me! They'll kill me! Kill me! Ah! He's dead. There's nothing I could do to save him. His toys became alive and attacked him, and now the chemical is worn off. They're, they're nothing but toys again. What can I do? What can I do? It's too late for you to do anything, Alan. Uncle Barnaby. You know the rules of Toyland. If anyone is accused of murder, they hang. But I accuse you. But, but I, I didn't do it. Look out, Uncle Barnaby. Look out for that jar of chemicals. Uh, uh, oh. <coughs> Uncle Barnaby, you've broken the bottle of secret chemicals. It splashed all over the toys. What's this? Those toys are alive. They're coming to life. Run! Run, Uncle Barnaby! Kill you! Kill you! I, I can't get away from him! Help! Run! Oh, Alan! Alan, I'm so glad you're safe. I'll, I'll never quarrel with you again. I'm sorry I quarreled with you too, Jane. But now Uncle Barnaby's dead and our troubles are over. The chemical wore off and the toys are just toys again. I'm glad you're safe too, Alan. Contrary, Mary. When did you get here? Just a little while ago. And I don't feel so contrary anymore, Alan. You, you don't? Not quite so much. Oh, say, what a wonderful day this is. What day is it, anyhow? Why, Christmas, of course. Didn't you know, Alan? Christmas? Hooray!
to the end of our story and of course everyone lives happily ever after everyone except that dreadful Uncle Barnaby <laughs> and that's as it should be as for the toy maker well don't worry children I didn't really die I just had a narrow escape that's all I'm feeling fit as a fiddle and just wait until you see the new toys I've made for you by the way I never did tell you my real name it's Santa Claus Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas!
The Chicago Theater of the Air ran locally starting May 1940 on WGN Radio and then nationally on the Mutual Broadcasting System from October 5, 1940 to September 11, 1954. The show grew out of listener surveys conducted by WGN that showed many listeners enjoyed opera and drama. The show combined both into 60-minute operettas. Intermission commentary was originally by conductor Henry Weber and later by Chicago Tribune publisher Robert R. McCormick. As the program began its seventh season, McCormick commented on its growth, quote, Three years ago, the demand for tickets to these broadcasts became so great that our original auditorium studio became entirely inadequate. Then, too, the program itself outgrew the studio as the size of the orchestra, chorus, and dramatic cast became larger and larger to meet the requirements of more complicated productions. So it was decided to move to the Medina Temple. Here we can accommodate nearly 5,000 guests each week and have the necessary facilities for any type of production, unquote. Babes in Toyland have been presented numerous times on radio, TV, and film with noteworthy productions, including the 1934 movie version starring Laurel Lynn Hardy, which includes not only the Disney song Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf, but features a cameo by none other than Mickey Mouse himself, no doubt due to Walt Disney being a fan of Stan and Ollie, as well as being a close friend of director Hal Roach. Disney took his own crack at the story in his 1961 filming, featuring Ray Bolger, Tommy Sands, Annette Funicello, and Ed Wynn, and a 1986 TV movie version starred Drew Barrymore, Keanu Reeves, Pat Morita, and Eileen Brennan, with additional music by Leslie Brickus. Theaters across the country need your support now, more than ever. We hope you'll consider a donation to Porchlight Music Theater today. Just go to porchlightmusictheater.org. Until next time on Classic Musicals from the Golden Age of Radio, I'm Michael Weber.